Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University for PyTorch. So to make use of something like PyTorch, we are going to use tabular data for the beginning. We'll get into images and other advanced topics as we progress through the course, but to make use of tabular data, we're going to use something called pandas. So here is the notebook that we're going to make use of for this part. I'm going to go ahead and open it in Colab, just in case I want to actually run anything. So here we are in Colab. This introductory part just checks to see if Colab is there and sets a flag in case we need to run something differently for Colab or non-Colab, which usually isn't the case. All right. So Pandas works primarily with CSV files. You can read other file types as well, but I think of CSV as sort of the native format. And a CSV is really a file that fits nicely into something like a Microsoft Excel. So here I have a CSV file. This is a data set that is created for automobiles. And if I just enter that URL in there, it simply downloads it. And if I click to open it, it is going to launch Microsoft Excel. And here you can see the contents. This is why it's called tabular data. It fits nicely into a table. You've got several columns, and then you're gonna use those columns to predict, well, you're not gonna predict the name of the car, that would just be silly. You're trying to predict miles per gallon. So the target's actually in the first column in this particular data set. Often the target is usually at the end. So using other, all these other values, could you predict the miles per gallon? Or you could do it really any way you wanted to. Could you use the miles per gallon and all this other stuff to predict the cylinders? So what this code is going to do here, and this starting line is just to control how many columns are displayed. That's what that dot, dot, dot is. It's not displaying all the columns. This is part of how I format this nicely so that it fits into a paperback book. And it also looks nice on the, on the screen. So we're gonna do pd.readcsv, and we're simply going to read this data set in. You can also specify additional options if you want to deal with missing columns and how missing, missing values and how they are represented. We'll see more of that later. But here we simply load it in, miles per gallon, cylinders, displacement, all of this. You can see basically the same thing that we saw in Microsoft Excel, except it's here in program code and you can work with it. The display function shows it a little nicer if you want to use this when you're in Jupyter. And you can specify max rows and columns. That controls these dot, dot, dots. There'll be essentially a plus sign of dot, dot, dots where it's removing some rows and it's also removing some columns. You can also create a second data frame so you can, you can process it. And this is what we're doing here. I am stripping non-numeric values from that miles per gallon data set automatically. I'm getting the headers, so that's the first row, and then I'm looping through all the fields in the headers, and I am one by one appending for the numeric values, because I strip the, the non-numerics up here, only ints and floats. For each of those fields, I am calculating some standard statistical values. I'm gonna print the name, the mean, the variance and the standard deviation. You can see here, I'm building this up basically as a list of dictionaries. It's why we learned about dictionaries earlier in the course, because they're used a lot for this kind of thing. You can see they're, they're almost like fields because each one of these has a, is a record and it has a name, which is one of the fields, mean, variance, standard deviation, and so forth. And I put them all into a list called fields. I can now convert that into a data frame. This is a very common temporary format that you put something in when you're building a data frame entirely of your own. Some of the assignments make you create data frames and this is one of the common ways to do it. It gives you complete control over what the data frame looks like, so long as it fits into memory. If it doesn't fit into memory, you probably need to stream it to a file. Missing values are something that we often have to deal with. Earlier, when we read this miles per gallon CSV, I also specify what not available values look like. So in this cars data set, I believe question marks are put in there and that 
indicates that the value is simply not known. It wasn't collected for whatever reason. I believe this data set was collected by some statistician long ago in the 1970s, collecting uh, Motor Trends magazines and getting the, the miles per gallon, the horsepower, all this. Maybe the magazine didn't report horsepower in one case. So here we are going to replace those missing values. So I'm gonna print out, does horsepower have not a not null values? And to do this, we do pandas.isNull. We're checking to see if there's any null values in the horsepower column, values.any. So that lets us know if there's any NA values there. And if there are, and it says true, if there are, we're going to fill them with the median. Median is usually what you will replace a missing value with. Don't use mean because it's outlier sensitive. I mean, let's say that I put everybody in this class and I wanted to calculate your mean net worth and then I threw Alan Musk into the meal, into the mix. So he, everybody would have probably a net worth over hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, if, if we average that all together. But the median would not be as reflective of that outlier. I'll also point out another thing that you will see. Notice here, I, for the data frame, I'm doing data frame dot horsepower, and I'm passing, I'm using indexing to, to get to it. You can also do this. These are two common ways that you will see. Mostly I'm switching over to this format, but the indexing form does have some advantages. This is hard coded, so that's part of the code. Whereas this is a string, you could put that off in a configuration file or something such as that. So if you need to really vary what the column is going to be, you can use a string. If you want to simply hard code it into there, this is the other approach. There's advantages to, to each way. Most of the examples you'll see in the course are this way. Some of them do use the dot notation. Dealing with outliers, we're going to remove outliers. That's another way to deal with them rather than taking the median. But sometimes you don't want your neural network confused by outliers. So the way remove outliers works here is we're going to pass in a data frame, the name of the column we want to remove, and then the maximum number of standard deviations before something is considered an outlier. Two is a common number to use here. Anything that's two standard deviations plus or minus from the mean could be considered to be an outlier. We get a list of those rows and then we drop them. And we're gonna drop them in place. You'll see that a lot in pandas. If you don't put in place, then it returns a whole new data frame rather than modifying the data frame that you're working on. I usually like to do things in place unless I want to create this sort of duplicate. And I call it sort of a duplicate because it's not completely a duplicate. It's, it's a lot of values mapped over and sometimes you, you do need to truly duplicate it if you want two copies of the column and you want to modify them. So this code will remove outliers. We're going to read in the auto MPG data set. We're going to determine the median value and we're going to fill in any missing values with the median. We're going to drop the name because the name of the automobile does not do much for us. We'd have to use natural language processing if we truly did want to use it as a predictive input. We're going to look at the length uh, before miles per gallon outliers were dropped and then after. So we remove anything that is two, two standard deviations above the mean. And you can see there were 398, now we're down to 388. So we removed some outlier vehicles. Sometimes you want to drop fields, just like I did for name. Dropping name is quite easy. This one here is the axis. One means that you're dropping columns, zero means you're dropping rows. You can ca also concatenate rows and columns. Using that same data set again, we are going to get the, the horsepower values, we're getting the names, and then we're building a list of the name of the car and the horsepower. And we do that by concatenating together the column names and the horsepower. So the, the name column and the horsepower, axis of one, so it's concatenating columns. You can also concatenate rows together as well. So you can read in this data set and you can then concatenate, create a new data frame that just has the first two and the last two. So this is how you concatenate rows together. 
In machine learning, you're going to often want to move things into a training and a validation set. You want the neural network to only learn on the training set. And then you'll use the validation set later on to check it. There's several methods to do this. You can take the data set, you break it into validation and training. You can also use cross-validation, where you break it into 10 different folds, and each time through, one of the folds is the validation, the other nine are training, depending on how many folds you have. You could have five folds as well, or any number. You couldn't have just one fold. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. So here we are breaking this into a training and a validation set. First, we randomize it. So this shuffles the rows of the data set. Then we create a mask. A mask is where we are creating something up to the length of the data set. And these are random numbers. So we're creating a number of random numbers equal to the length of the, of the data set, the data frame. And those random numbers can be between 0 and 1. So anytime the random number is below 0 0.8, this is going to be true. So those true values, which should be about 80% of them, that is going to be your training set. The rest, the little tilde there, flips the binary operation, so all the trues become falses, and that's the other 20%, approximately. It's not guaranteed to be 80%, because it is random. And we print the size of each. When you go to send this stuff off to PyTorch to train, you're going to need to have just numeric values. And you can convert it into a numpy array by doing that. So you just do df.values, and now it's a nice, well, mostly numeric array. You can have both characters and numbers in a numpy array, but before you train, you're going to need to get rid of those textual values. That's a common mistake that students make, is they will get very strange errors when they send this off to PyTorch. TensorFlow has kind of the same issues as well, and it, it just blows up, because you need to do something to convert those to numeric values. If you wish to only convert some of these, and this is what you'll see a lot in the code later in this course, I will list the columns that I want, say as, for example, the predictors, and then I do dot values. Now you've just got the numeric ones. You can also save your data frames to a CSV. That can be valuable, particularly if you want to examine it, because looking at things in Jupyter can be kind of, kind of annoying at a, after a point. I like to often open them in a specific CSV viewer, like an Excel or a LibreOffice or something like that. All you do to do that is to do the to CSV. All that I'm doing here is essentially randomizing it and then writing a re-randomed version of it. This index equals false means don't put an index number. So don't throw this dummy column in front that is just a count from 0 to 100. I saw that first in R. I don't know. I find that feature quite, quite annoying. I blame R. So saving a data frame to a pickle, this can be useful because you'll get some weird results sometimes if you're dealing with highly precise numbers or you're just doing validation checks. If you save it off to the CSV and then you pull it back in, you can sometimes get very minute but significant differences. And this really only matters usually if you're comparing two things right back together and you notice, well, okay, why did we change a little bit just going through a CSV? So if you pickle it, then it's a binary image of it. And when you reload it, it's exactly like it was when it when it came back. And here I'm just showing you how you can save it as a, as a pickle file. You make use of pickle, the pickle package. This is how you load one, and this is how you save one. Very handy. And pickle is also faster than CSV if you're dealing with very, very large in-memory data sets. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to the channel and click the bell to be notified whenever I release a new class or more advanced topics beyond the introduction to PyTorch class. Thanks for watching.